Um, OK, I want to talk today about um, continue our discussion of oligopoly. We, last time, we talked about non-cooperative equilibria. But we, in the start, we said, gee, life would just be better off if everyone could just cooperate. And someone even asked me, well, why don't they just cooperate? So let's talk about that. Let's talk about cartels. What happens when firms try to cooperate, achieve the cooperative equilibrium in oligopolies? Now, clearly, this is going to be the best outcome. So to fix examples, let's go back to our example of last time, American United. Recall last time we said that demand was of the form 339 minus Q. Price is 339 minus Q. Uh, and that the marginal cost was 147. OK? Now, we talked about the fact that if American was a monopoly in this market, they would simply solve the monopolist problem. They would set marginal revenue, which is 339 minus 2Q, equal to marginal cost, which is 147. And they would get that the optimal Q would be uh, 96. And then reading back off the demand curve, that would imply, imply an optimal quantity of $243. OK? So that was what we got last time. Now imagine that America is not a monopoly, but American United cooperate. What if they got together and said, you know what? Let's behave as if we're one monopolist, flying 96 flights and just splitting them equally. We'll do 48, you do 48. So let's cartelize. Let's achieve the monopoly outcome. And let's just share 50-50 the fruits of that outcome. So in that case, each firm would fly 48 flights at a price of $243. Okay? And total profits in the market, each firm would then make profits of 48 times price minus average cost, which is marginal cost, because it's flat, times 243 minus 147. Or since I, you, I'm not like you guys can't do that in my head, 4608 per firm. OK? So each firm would achieve profits of 40. They'd take the 96 flights, split them in half, and then each achieve profits of 4608. Now, what we can see is that these profits are much higher than what they got in the non-cooperative equilibrium. Remember, the non-cooperative equilibrium, they were each doing 64 flights at a price of uh, they were each doing 64 flights at a price of 211. We solved that last time. So what were their non-cooperative profits? Their non-cooperative profits for each firm was 64 times the 211 they were charging minus the 147 in marginal costs. Or their former profits were 4,096. So their profits used to be 4,096 when they weren't cooperating. They've gone up by 12.5% to 46.08 by cooperating. So simply by getting together, saying, don't be an asshole, let's cooperate, let's figure out how to make the most money, getting together, they solve the prisoner's dilemma, get to the best outcome, and make a lot more money. OK? So the question is, why don't they always do this in oligopolistic markets? And fundamentally, there's two reasons. Now, normal people, you'll see when I'm done, normal people will teach them in a different order than I will. But let me start with the two reasons in the order economists would teach them. The first reason why cartels don't form is that they're fundamentally, fundamentally unstable. Cartels are fundamentally unstable as long as firms are self-interested. Each individual firm in a cartel has an incentive to cheat. And that's because they essentially can solve the monopoly problem of poisoning by cheating. Let me explain how that works. This best see is through numbers. Let's imagine that we start in this cooperative equilibrium, 48 flights each and profits of 4608. And now let's imagine the middle, that quietly, American increased its number of flights from 48 to 50. American says, well, I know I agreed 48, but on the slide, I'm going to fly two more flights and hope they don't catch me. OK? Well, what's American's profits? Well, their quantity is 50. Q, Q sub A is now 50. What's the price if they're going to do 50 flights? What's the price? Yeah. I'm sorry? It's 280. It's, uh, the price is, let's see if you got that right. I've got to check my notes. Um, no. Uh, no. It, the price was 243 when they're monopoly. Now they're doing two more flights. 
Remember, they're adding two flights to the total. There used to be, there used to be 96 flights, now it goes to 98 flights. So the price falls to 241, OK? So you were thinking about them as a loan, but remember, they're still United doing the flights too. They're still doing 48 flights. So there were 96 flights total. Now it goes to 98, so the price falls to 241. Okay, so what's their profits? Their profits are now 50 times 241 minus 147, or 4,700. Their profits have gone up. Okay, let me back up and do it again because I went fast. Okay, they say they're going to two more flights. We have to respect the demand curve. So there's going to be two more flights. The price has to fall. If the price falls, then uh, the price has to fall 241. They now make profits of 4,700. Okay. Well, if United is caught with their pants down and continues to do 48 flights, what does United make? Well, United's still doing 48 flights, so the profits of United are 48 times 241 minus 147, or um, 4512. So Americans' profits are up and United's profits are down through American cheating. What happened? How, by cheating, did they drive? What's the intuition of why them cheating drove their profits up and United's down? And in fact, if you add these up, lowered total profits in the market. What's going on? Yeah. The quantity, uh, you're lowering the price that you can sell um, each unit for. But for um, American, because they're increasing the number of units they're selling, they still make a greater profit. Whereas as United is staying the same, because each unit is being sold for less, they're making a lesser that, that, That's almost right. You got most of it. But there's one key wrinkle that's important, which is a monopolist would have the same argument. Um, the, di the key thing is, why doesn't, what stops a monopolist from raising the price from where he is? Yeah. The poisoning effect. But think about the poisoning effect. Who's the poisoning effect effect? Everyone in the market. Everyone sees a lower price. But only American gets more flights. So they essentially get the benefit. It's like you said, they get the benefit of the extra flights, but only half the penalty of the poisoning effect. So for them, it is optimal to, to lower the price and sell more. Because they share the negative effect, the negative part with United, but they get all the positive part. Once again, a monopolist, when you, when you try to sell more and lower the price, there's a positive part, which is sell more units, but a negative part, which is the poisoning effect. Well, here, American gets all the positive part and only half the negative part. So they make money by cheating. Okay. Well, of course, United knows this. They saw the price go down. They know American's cheating. So United wants to cheat, and the whole thing breaks apart. So our ca cartels are unstable because by cheating, you get all the benefit, but only part of the cost. And so, so cheating is incentivized in a cartel. And therefore, cartels will break down. They're not stable. OK? So that's the primary reason economists say we don't see cartels. The other reason people like to bring up is this little thing they're illegal. But you know, we don't let stuff like that bother us as economists. But they are illegal. That's another reason why we don't see cartels. Um, in the late 1800s, cartels were quite common. In the late 1800s, big industries like oil and railroad industries came to be dominated by a few large firms. Um, and they tried to become cartels, but it kept breaking down. So it's been in the late 1800s with oil companies, Standard Oil, and the big railroad companies. They kept trying to have cartels, and it kept breaking down. So they came up with this idea. They basically um, said, look, we can't trust each other. So we're going to, every firm is going to turn over all its decisions to a common trust. And there'll be a trust that's got representatives from every firm on the board. But we will publicly commit to what we're going to produce at what price. And therefore, we can make sure there's no cheating. So essentially, every firm still involved, they're all on this trust board. But they're making that decision in a, in a, in a way that's at least public to them, not public to the public, but public to them, so they can make sure they're not cheating. So they form these trusts and essentially cartelized and made huge profits. And it worked. It solved the stability problem because cheating could be observed more, more readily. Now, would it have solved it for very long? We don't know. Because the government, the public got pissed, and the government came in and passed what's called antitrust laws. And antitrust laws are laws which do not permit the cartelization of, of oligopolistic industries in this way. So let's talk about antitrust laws and how they work or how they don't work. 
I want to do a couple examples. One example is the movie industry. Now, the movie industry, you know, is a classic oligopolistic industry. You know, there's a few players. There's new players. A24 is huge now, what didn't exist 15 years ago. Um, but by and large, it's sort of a few players you've heard of uh, which dominate the industry. Okay? These, and the way the industry works is movie companies make and they produce the movies and then sell them to movie theaters that show the movies. They show a variety of movies at any one time. Well, what happened was in the 30s and 40s, the production companies started buying up the movie theaters. And what they do when they bought the movie theaters, they say to the movie theater, we now own you and you will only show our movies. So they say to the movie theater, we now own you, you know, movie theater on the corner of you know, Lincoln and Kennedy Streets, and we're MGM and you only show MGM movies. And essentially, what that meant was essentially they were uh, taking over, monopolizing a given distribution network. And they essentially carved it up. They agreed, OK, you get these theaters, we'll take these theaters. And essentially, that was the way they formed their cartel, was through distribution. And the federal government jumped in and said that that was an antitrust violation. The federal government sued and won. And so that industry, that, that, um, that was broken up. But did that mean, that didn't mean folks stopped trying to cartelize, it just meant they stopped being so obvious about it. So later moves to cartelize were more hidden. So for example, um, in the early 2000s, airline industries were in big trouble because oil prices were going way up. Due to the Iraq war and other factors, oil prices were going way up and the airline industry was in trouble. So in 2004, British Airlines and Virgin Atlantic had secret talks about essentially cartelizing the cross-Atlantic market from the East Coast to, uh, to London. And what they did is they said, look, if we sort of obviously set our prices together, people are going to notice. So what we're going to do is instead is we're going to add fuel surcharges to the bill. We're going to say, oh, gas get, oil's getting more expensive. Your price haven't changed, but there's now a fuel surcharge on your bill. And that fuel surcharge um, is going to be something you won't pay attention to, so they won't notice that we're rising it together. And these fuel surcharges rose quickly from $10 to $120 per flight, and essentially rose in lockstep. They essentially coordinated, but tried to hide it by making the coordination not over the sticker price, but over the thing at sort of the bottom of your ticket, which was the fuel surcharge. So this worked for a while, but then what happened? Well, what happened was the prisoner's dilemma was that lawyers, uh, for, um, lawyers for Virgin Airlines started worrying they were going to get busted. And they said, well, if we go to the feds first and bust British Airlines, maybe we'll get a better deal. So they were essentially the prisoner that ratted. So Virgin Atlantic went, was the prisoner that ratted, and the whole thing broke down. And there were penalties more on British Airlines because Virgin Atlantic ratted on them. Uh, but just like the prisoner's dilemma breaks down, it broke down in reality. And so that was something not where the law really worked, but where the, uh, the cartel was unstable. Um, and the end result was Virgin Atlantic paid no fees, paid no penalty, and British Airlines paid more than $500 million. So British Airlines clearly did not study the prisoner's dilemma and did not realize that uh, they should have gone first in ratting out Virgin, Virgin Atlantic. Um, now, that said, sometimes cartels open, operate openly in the public and get away with it. Okay? Let's talk about probably the biggest open cartel in America, perhaps in America today, the National Football League. Okay? The National Football League, football is the most popular sport in America, the most profitable sport in America. There are 32 teams, and there are essentially 32 businesses whose job it is to produce football wins. Okay? Now, these businesses have a huge incentive to collude with their fellow business, however, because, because they can, because of television rights. So if the New York Giants and the New York Jets competed over the television rights for their area, they would compete away the profits that could be made by getting a big contract. If they collude and say, no, you can only, we will only agree to a contract together, they can get a higher price for that contract. Because it's either you give them the contract or you're out. If they competed, TV companies could compete against each other and fight the price down. Okay? And in general, actually, this goes more than this. The league sells the rights to televise games as a package. So in fact, the National Football League literally sells explicitly says, we have a cartel of 32 teams. We are selling the monopoly right to televise these games. Somebody's got Sunday, somebody's got Thursday, somebody's got Monday night, et cetera. But it's a monopoly product they're selling. Now, how did they get away with that? Well, basically, actually, in 1957, they were busted. That's a long time ago. That's even before I was born, that long ago. 
Okay, they were busted. And the court ruled that the NFL was violating antitrust laws. Okay? Now, that was for 1957. That was 60 years ago. The NFL still makes about $40 billion on its television contract. What happened? Congress just exempted them. Congress said, well, you know what? We know they're violating antitrust, but we're going to pass a law which exempts them from antitrust law and let them do it. So it proves basically that Americans like football more than free markets. Uh, and basically, we now have a cardinalized football industry uh, that, um, uh, because Congress basically exempted them from the laws. OK? So those are some examples. Yeah? Is this also true of other sports teams? Um, other sports teams, it is not as, th there are, it's largely true for other sports leagues. It's largely true. The, 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 uh, some of the provisions aren't explicit as for football, but it's largely true for other sports leagues as well. What about on an international level with things like soccer? Better? I don't know, actually. I presume it's similar. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know that you have international antitrust laws. I'm not sure how that works with international league. It's a good question. Um, OK. Now, another form of cartels, we talked about cartels and how companies incentive to put them together. Actually, sometimes the federal, the government can make a cartel. Yeah? How well is OPEC working? How's what? How well is OPEC working? OPEC? So OPEC is, as I mentioned in the first lecture, a series of countries that get together to produce oil. It's not working as well as it was when I was a kid. It worked really well because more countries, A, more countries are cheating, and more countries, there's more oil being found outside OPEC. But it still works. It's sort of a partially functioning cartel, is I think the way to think about it. Um, OK, so let me, um, let me actually uh, let me go on and talk about, well, let's do one more example about a time when a government made a cartel. Here's a, one more interesting example. So in the early 1980s, before the early 1980s, the US dominated the car production business. Starting in the late 70s, Japan started making huge inroads into car production. And by the early 1980s, we're in recession, and car manufacturers in the US are really pissed uh, that Japan was taking so much of our market. And we'll talk in a couple lectures about international trade and all those set of issues. But put those issues aside, right now you just have this issue that car manufacturers um, wanted to uh, limit the amount of Japanese cars that come into America. Now, you guys have been reading in the paper about international trade and why economists typically don't like limiting, uh, limiting international trade. And Reagan was you know, a standard Republican, part of the party of free trade. So Reagan said, well, we're not going to limit the cars that Japan wants to send in. But we're going to tell Japan, if you guys were willing to agree to a voluntary export restraint, we wouldn't mind. So what he said to Japan, they imposed something called a voluntary export constraint, which basically said, we will negotiate a deal with you where you will voluntarily agree to reduce the number of cars you send to America. OK? It's not a government policy. This isn't big government. This is private negotiations with private company, voluntary agreement. OK. Japan, Japan happily agreed to this. Why? Yeah? Very, you know? Because? Because you made a cartel. Because the Japanese companies used to have to compete with each other to sell the cars in America. Now it's like, OK, you guys get together and limit how many cars you send. They're like, great. You've given us an ability to form a cartel by essentially telling us, get together and figure out how you're going to sell this many cars to America. So essentially, this voluntary export restraint is essentially cartelized. Um, uh, and no company could cheat. So if you had a cartel, any company tried to cheat, they couldn't sell the cars because the US wouldn't let them come into the US. So essentially, the US provided them a way of enforcing their cartel. What happened? Well, um, the average price of a Japanese car in America went up by $1,200. Okay. U.S. auto profits did go up, but U.S. consumers lost out by way more than producers gained. And on that, the estimates are that U.S. consumers are about $3 billion. Overall, U.S. is about $3 billion worse because of this policy. It's just examples of how different, way, different government policies can interact with uh, the cardinalization of industries. Yeah? Company like price matches. Isn't that sort of like making a cartel? Because like, the other company would see that they're going to price match. They wouldn't want to set a price lower than what the... Well, it's a great question, and you're pointing out this is not a solid line. And in some sense, the question is if it's true that so for many years, tobacco industry worked this way. There was one large player, Philip Morris. Philip Morris would sort of raise the price that everyone would match. Now, as long as there's no evidence that they agreed to do that, that is not illegal. If there's evidence they agreed to that, it's illegal. But as long as it's just like, no, we're just, this is the way it's going to work, then that's not illegal. So basically, that's sort of an implicit cartel. Now, once again, what's holding it together? 
nothing. A company could cheat and try to, be, try to charge less. But basically, that essentially, they figured they were working better as a cartel, and essentially it was hard to, there was no way to bust it. Yeah. No, I mean, like, if a company says to consumers, like, if you can bring in a lower price, we'll sell it for that price. That's sort of a different, I mean, you could imagine, you would need every company to do that. That would be a cartel enforcing way if every company had that deal in a market. But if one company has that deal, doesn't, doesn't enforce the cartel. Every company needs to have that deal. And so the question is, if every company, if every company on their own organically decided we're going to have that deal, that would essentially be a way of trying to bring enforce the cartel. But I think that would be hard to say was an antitrust was an antitrust violation. It's good, good questions. Other questions. Okay. So now let's ask, why do we care about all this? We care about all this because it matters for ultimately what matters to us in this class, which is economic welfare. Okay. So now let's go to the second thing I want to cover, which is comparing the equilibria. We've now covered three types of market structures, perfect competition, monopoly, and oligopoly. Now let's compare them. And I compare them in two ways, quantity sold and profits, and profits, um, profits per firm, profits earned per firm. And we're going to stick with this United American market. Okay? We know if there's a monopoly, if this is a monopoly, if they can car perfectly cartelize, then there'll be 96 flights total. Each will fly 48 flights. And profits per firm will be 46.08. Okay, we solved that already. That's the cartel outcome. The non-cooperative outcome, which we'll call the oligopoly outcome, is they each sell 64 flights. We solved that last time. And as we solved here, they each make profits of 4096. What's the competitive outcome in this market? What's the competitive outcome in this market? First of all, what's the price? Somebody raise their hand and tell me. If this is a perfectly competitive market, what would the price be? And, what, and then what would the quantity be? Yeah. 47. Price would be 147, because a perfectly competitive market, price would be marginal cost. So profits would be zero. zero. And quantity would be 339 minus 147, or 192. Okay. So here we have, for a given market, a nice table which lets us compare the three different possible outcomes. And what you see is essentially the more you can monopolize, the higher your profits, but the smaller the market. Okay? So basically, three lessons here. First of all, generally speaking, the oligopoly outcome is somewhere between the monopoly and perfectly competitive outcome. Where in between, take 1412. What 1412 was about is how you figure out where in between this outcome comes between these two. It's all about game theory. Okay? So that's what's exciting about game theory is this is a wide range. And game theory is it says sophisticated tools that let us pin down where in this range companies will end up in the realistic case. Point two is the more you can monopolize, the higher your profits will be. But let us come to welfare. Now, I haven't computed sur social surplus here. But here's the cheat. I don't really need to. I don't need to because essentially, Roughly speaking, social welfare is proportional to the quantity sold. In other words, we know that in a perfectly competitive market, this is the, the welfare maximizing quantity is 192. We know that if there's 192 flights, that maximizes welfare because that's the competitive outcome. What we're saying is the more, oh, this shouldn't be 64, it should be 128. That's my bad. 128, it's each doing 64. We know that as we monopolize the market, there are fewer and fewer flights. Therefore, we're creating a deadweight loss. Essentially, deadweight loss is proportional. Actually, it's sort of exponentially proportional to the gap between the quantity sold and the competitive quantity. Welfare is maximized here by definition. We prove that. So any reduction from that means it increases deadweight loss. So the more you reduce quantity, the more you lower welfare. So essentially, as we go down the, down the column, we lower profits, but raise social welfare. Yeah? Um, on the top line, I'm sure, are we talking about an oligopoly that acts like a monopoly? Yeah, well, it's monop you know, cartel slash monopoly. Yes. Okay. But otherwise, do 96 to profits would be, would be twice that. But the bottom line is that essentially you've got, uh, you, you've got essentially more profits in this market. 
OK? Other questions about that? So the bottom line is the more competitive the market, the higher the welfare, but the lower the profits. OK? So that's kind of our, our bottom line of how we think about this. Questions about that? OK, next thing I want to cover. We've only covered the case of two firms. What if there are many firms? After all, most oligopoly markets are not just two firms. Car market, we've talked about cars and uh, movie producing studios. There are many firms. OK, well, the Cournot model is super hard to do. Um, when there's more firms. But there's no reason you can't. It literally just becomes three equations of three unknowns, a four equations of four unknowns. Literally, as you can see, you can simply see if you take that model and add more firms, it just expands the state space. It becomes impossible to graph, but you could solve it. Eventually, you've got n equations uh, in n unknowns. The key bottom line result is that as the, Cournot, as the number of firms gets large, the Cournot equilibrium approaches the competitive equilibrium. That is, mathematically, if you solve this, you don't have to solve this, but the bottom line condition is the markup that firms earn is equal to minus 1 over n times the elasticity. In, in sort of a market, this is sort of in a symmetric Cournot market of the kind we've been working with. The markup is 1 over the number of firms times the elasticity of, times the elasticity of demand. So think about this for a second. Imagine there is one firm. Then this equation says the markup is equal to minus 1 over the elasticity of demand. Where have we seen that before? That's the monopoly condition. That's the monopoly markup condition. So when n equals 1, this is an equation we've seen before, the monopoly markup condition. When n equals 2, the firms are making half as much. When n equals 3, a third, uh, it, it goes a fact, factor of third, et cetera. What this says is n approaches infinity. We approach the competitive outcome. Okay, we'll never get there, but we're asymptoting towards the competitive outcome, which basically says, you know, it's sort of like my point about contestable markets. You get a market that's sort of competitive enough, you're going to shrink. You're going to shrink the markup as more and more firms enter. Okay, so that's sort of a general condition uh, that we could derive that shows that um, as more firms. Um, uh, as more firms are in, uh, then you get uh, a lower markup. Um, now I want to make, there's actually, but this actually understates the case for an important strategic reason, which is more firms lowers the markup in a, in a more firm lowers the markup in a Cournot non-cooperative model, but more firms also makes a cooperative model harder. So this is for the non-cooperative model. The non-cooperative model, your profits fall as there are more firms. But it also gets harder to cooperate as there are more firms. Because there are more, peop there are more people you have to trust, more people you have to keep hold of. So a great example of this, actually for a long time, mercury, the stuff we use in thermometers and such, only was found in Italy and Spain, in the mines in Italy and Spain. And they had a cartel between the two countries to sell mercury. What happened, other countries discovered mercury, and they couldn't keep the cartel together. And the price of mercury fell a lot. We have the question about OPEC, similar thing. OPEC was much more successful in the 1970s when essentially the only source of oil were basically these Arab nations that form OPEC. What happened over time is we discovered more oil around the world, in particular in Russia and in the US, which has sort of broken the power of this cartel to a large extent. So the reason why a bigger market moves us towards the competitive equilibrium is that it makes it harder to maintain a cartel. OK? Now. Let's actually, the other issue I want to cover here is I want to talk about what, is, what does all this teach us about a key policy issue, which is the issue of mergers. What does everything we've learned here tell us about thinking about mergers? OK, we know about mergers. It happens all the time. Two companies merge. Well, it turns out when companies merge and they're large enough, the federal government regulates that. The federal government gets a vote on whether that merger is going to be allowed to go forward either the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission, depending on what, kind, what industry it is. So the federal government has to decide how do you evaluate whether two firms merging is a good idea or not. And essentially, what it comes down to is a simple trade-off. Economies of scale versus market power. 
The benefit of two firms merging is economies of scale. If two firms have sort of redundant production processes and they merge, they can be more efficient. There can be positive economies of scale for merging firms. Okay? So there's cost efficiencies, basically. Economies of scale deliver cost efficiencies. On the other hand, the more firms merge, the more this N goes down, and the more markets go up, and the worse it is for consumers. So the trade-off is, do you want to reduce? Is reducing N worth it in terms of the economies of scale? Or in other words, does the producer efficiency go up enough to make up for the potential loss to consumers of this less competitive market? OK? People understand that? Now, an interesting case of this, which has been, got very big implications for all of us in America, is hospital mergers. During the decade of the 2000s, there was a rash of hospital mergers where hospitals said, look, here's a classic case for economies of scale, because hospitals have what's called a peak load problem. They have to have empty beds. Hospitals can't be full all the time, because there might be a car accident and people need beds. So by definition, it's inefficient for hospitals to be at 100% capacity. Hospitals want to have excess capacity. The problem with that is if there's two hospitals next to each other, each with excess capacity, that's inefficient. It'd be more efficient to have one hospital, one merged hospital, than they could just manage the proper amount of excess capacity. And hospitals made this argument, and we basically approved any hospital merger that they wanted in the 2000s. Well, what happened? What happened is the hospitals lied. They kept both hospitals open, kept all the empty beds, and just raised prices. So essentially, the hospital mergers did not deliver any of the economies of scale they promised, but did deliver a lot of the market power we feared. So a huge cause of the increase in medical spending in the 2000s was these hospital mergers, which essentially took a lot of the comp competitive pressure out of the medical market uh, and didn't really deliver economies of scale. And this is the hard part about being a regulator. Most of what public policy economists do in the world is, is regulate all over the world. There are thousands of economists employed all over the world, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, whose job it is to make regulatory decisions of this nature. And they're really hard. Because we've drawn nice, clean, theoretical models here. But we have to know, what's epsilon? You know, how much, how, uh, what's epsilon to figure out the effect of consumers? What are the economies of scale? Will they actually exploit those economies of scale, et cetera? So these are really hard and interesting decisions. Now, let's go on to the last topic I want to cover today, which is price competition. Price competition. Now, the models we've been discussing so far have been what we call quantity competition. <laughs> that United American compete on how many flights to send, and then the demand curve tells them what they can charge. But in fact, in many markets, that's not how firms compete. In fact, we even mentioned it. Someone mentioned about best price offers, et cetera. <clears throat> they don't compete on quantity. They compete on price. And that's a different model named after another French economist, Bertrand, a model of Bertrand competition is the model of price competition, is the model we call Bertrand competition. This model says that basically two firms compete over what price to set, and then the quantity is determined by the, by the price that results from that competition. So they don't compete over quantity, they compete over price. And the main curve then tells you the quantity. Okay. Now, in this case, what's really striking about Bertrand competition is that unlike the Carnot model, under Bertrand competition, two firms can be enough to get us to the competitive equilibrium. Why? Why do we only potentially need two firms to get the competitive equilibrium? Yeah? I'll do you lower. Why don't you explain a little bit more what you mean? One firm, like, one firm like, the a little low, the other one is a little lower. And, like, you know, like... Exactly. As long as there's profits to be made, it's like our entry exit decision, right? As long as there's profits to be made, I'm going to come in at a price one penny below you, make one penny less profits, and steal all the business from you. So if there's perfect competition between firms in a Bertrand sense, then you only need two firms to get to the competitive equilibrium in theory. OK? So it's a very different idea than Cornell competition, where you need many, many firms to get close to this competitive outcome. With price competition, because firms are always kind of competing to go one penny below each other, in a, in a market that's otherwise competitive, you can actually drive the price to competitive price. 
through essentially you can actually drive the price down to marginal cost. It's sort of like I talked about contestable markets, and as long as the profit be made, someone would enter. Here, as long as there's profit to be made, someone will lower their price. And that'll keep happening until price equals marginal cost. So in Bertrand competition, you actually can get close to or at to the competitive outcome with a small number of firms. Now, two points to make about this. Your first point is, well, holy shit, how do I decide which one of these to use? You've just taught me, you've just spent you know, a lecture and a half on this fancy model, spent about 37 seconds on this model. How do I know which one to use? You didn't even write down any math, so I don't know what to do. I'm freaking out. OK, how do I know which one to use? Well, the bottom line is we're not going to ask you to do much math about Bertrand competition other than sort of the intuition they're competing over price. The more relevant question is how do you think about the situations where, where Cournot competition is more likely and Bertrand competition is more likely? So what do you think? In what types of markets do you think Cournot competition would be more likely? And in what kinds of markets do you think Bertrand competition would be more likely? Wouldn't the Bertrand be like really efficient in, in an elastic market? Well, no, elasticity is the same. So basically, elasticity um, is going to have a similar effect in both. It's going to basically drive the price down in both. Okay, because the elasticity is higher, draws the markup. Bertrand, it's going to it drive the elastic, drive it down in both. So it's not necessarily about elasticity. It's something about production processes. What type of production processes are going to lend themselves to price competition versus quantity competition? Think about it this way. If I offer a price, what do I have to do? Whether the, whether the production is dominated by the capital costs or the, or the data fixed cost or the variable costs. That's roughly speaking right. Basically, if there's long lags in production, I can't do price competition. So if I say I'm going to compete, people say, great, I want all your product. I'm like, great, you can have it in a year. That doesn't work. So things like auto companies are going to have a hard time with pure price competition. Because if Toyota says, OK, I'm a dollar less, everyone says, OK, great, we want a million Toyotas tomorrow, they can't do it. So things which are capital intensive lag production processes, it's going to be hard to have pure. Reality of life, of course, can be some mix of these. But it'll tend more towards quantity competition. Because you really are going to compete on what you're going to sell. Because that's sort of, you can't just infinitely supply it. Whereas other things, like cereal sales, where you can sort of immediately crank up a million more boxes of cereal in like a day out of your production processes, that will be more likely to be price competition. Things with small production lags, then you'd be more likely to have price competition. Because if you lower the price, all of a sudden you dominate the market, you can meet that demand. Okay? So essentially, we can think about price competition as being more likely the smaller the production lag, or maybe the less capital. It's not really about capital intensity, because you can have a capital intensity industry that can create things quickly. It's more about production lags. Now, we're never going to ask you to tell us which is right. And of course, in reality, life's somewhere in between. But this just gives you a sense of kind of when more, one type of competition is more likely uh, than the other. Yeah? Does this have anything to do why it's always a facility to protect the cereal in the grocery store? Great segue. You've jumped ahead to the last point I want to make, which is imagine you're in a Bertrand competition world, like with cereal. That's a pretty awful world if you're a producer. OK? Basically, that's where your markup's tiny, because anytime you try to raise the price, you get undercut. What can you do? Well, we've already gotten the answer. What you can do is you can engage in product differentiation. You can engage in product differentiation. OK? So basically, the reason why you're in Bertrand competition is because you're selling the same thing. Once I'm selling something different, I take on the features of a monopolist again. So if I can consumers to not think of my good as identical to my competitors, then I can price above marginal cost, and people will still buy it. The reason Bertrand competition drives price to marginal cost is because people view the goods as identical. But if they don't view the goods as identical, then I can keep price above marginal cost. Okay, And the example of breakfast cereals is the perfect way to illustrate this. So back around World War II, there were essentially basically like three types of cereal. Okay? There was Cheerios, there was Corn Flakes, and Quaker Oats. Okay, that's basically what cereal was. Not very exciting. Now, by the night, but by 1970, there were more than 150 breakfast cereals to choose from. 
including some which are variations of Cheerios and variation of cornflakes. In fact, you could all say, in some sense, all cereals variation of Cheerios and cornflakes and oats. Um, and then, um, and moreover, now if you go to the store today, you can actually buy generic versions of brand name cereals. So you can buy Odeos or Marshmallow Mates, which are Lucky Charms, or what are the, what's the other one? I love. We buy them in these big bags. You guys are buy these. Generic Lucky Charms, Marshmallow Mates, generic Captain Crunch is like, you know, Ahoy Matey or something. I don't know. They, they got these generic things which you can buy, which are really just the same. So essentially, what you do, what companies want to always do, which are Bertrand competition, is always try to product differentiate. Always try to figure out a way they can create a market where they can price uh, above marginal cost. OK? So for example, let's take General Mills a company that makes Cheerios, OK? They're making Cheerios, and then, they, and then all of a sudden, Odeos and stuff started coming along, and they weren't making money. What did they do? They created different kinds of Cheerios, like apple cinnamon Cheerios. General Mills did not create apple cinnamon Cheerios out of the goodness of their heart. General Mills created apple cinnamon Cheerios because they were getting killed in the Cheerio market. And so they tried to differentiate by having a new product that, on which they could charge a higher price, which was apple cinnamon Cheerios. Now, how do we feel about this? Well, it's not clear. On the one hand, by introducing apple cinnamon Cheerios, General Mills was able to push its price greater than marginal cost. And when it, as price pushes above marginal cost, quantity sold in the market falls. It created a dead weight loss. Quantity fell. And that's bad. Okay. On the other hand, apple cinnamon Cheerios are quite good. Okay. So this actually ends up being much like our patent discussion, which is essentially by differentiating, they've had two effects. They've lowered consumer surplus and welfare by pricing above marginal cost, but raised it by shifting out the demand curve by creating a new good that people want. Yeah? Um, like, isn't like, um, what doesn't like consumer <laughs> like that way of all things does not necessarily have to happen because like different people have different like demand curves and like the demand curve for like apple for cinnamon cereals is not having this. No, but the point is th that's okay. You're, you're, it's another way of stating my point. Even if the demand curve apple, let's say there's a new demand curve for apple cinnamon cereals that's way out. Okay, that's great. Okay, but still the fact that they're pricing above marginal cost means they'll sell fewer than they would in a competitive market. If they had invented out certain shows and sold at marginal cost, we'd still be way better off. So the trade-off is essentially how far out do we shift demand by creating this new product versus how much do we restrict sales by pricing it above marginal cost. So essentially, um, now, uh, and now what we have uh, is a market with about five firms that dominated and about 5,000 brands of cereal. Okay, so it's constant product differentiation. And essentially, this is the trade off with product differentiation, which is we get reduced sale, we get uh, dead weight loss because they're not pricing at marginal cost, but we get new products that people might like. Yeah? So, does a product like differentiation? Yeah, differentiation. Uh, does, like, is, is brand loyalty between like, things like Adidas and Nike or like? Well, actually, that's, that's really interesting. It depends on whether that brand loyalty is based on innovation or blind, or blind faith. So in some sense, this is, this is, once again, this gets into the deep, interesting issues of industrial organization that you talk about in game theory, which is if I can create brand loyalty by, in a way that makes you slightly better off, but keeps you in my brand forever, then that might be worse. If I create it in a way that makes you much better off, that might be better. So essentially, that's why, for example, you may have noticed you may be getting one or two credit card mailers. That's a, you guys, are you guys getting inundated with credit card offers? Okay, It's not because they love you guys. It's because if they hook you now, then you might stick with that credit card later. So they're trying to exploit, trying to get you. They're trying to give you a good deal now to get you hooked later so they can charge them closer to monopoly price later on. So essentially, there's a trade-off, which is if that loyalty is based on real differences in quality, that might be good. If it's not, it might not be. But the welfare gets very murky. It's a good question. Other questions? OK, so these are exciting real world topics. It's more reasons to go on and study more in economics. But let's stop now. We'll come back and we'll start talking about factor markets uh, on Monday.